stop crowding the stage. Sure. Now, come forward if you can. But welcome, welcome everybody. Apparently we are at TV versus online. If you're in the wrong room, you're stuck here now anyway. So, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are streaming live on discoverability.ca and apparently the uh, summit is trending in Canada. I'm not sure if you heard that, but that's, that's big news, so congrats. Um, we're sitting here on this panel, and I'm going to introduce uh, these charming gentlemen to you all, and we'll have um, a pretty open conversation. We're going to end with some Q&As, as usual, but uh, we're going to go through some pretty uh, uh, interesting discussions, but let me, uh, let me start in with the introductions. To my left is a lovely and talented Mr. Robin Neinstein. Robin, I'm going to read over my cheat sheets, and then I'm, I'm going to be good. Uh, production executive, original digital and drama, original drama content course entertainment, where Robin supervises multiple scripted series for global showcase in history. He oversees such flagship dramas as Vikings, history's uh, Canada's top series, and an up upcoming showcase series, Travelers, uh, in partnership with Netflix. Previously, he was with 20th Century Fox in Los Angeles. He co-founded Toronto's production company, Media Headquarters. He's worked with CBC Television on flagship dramas like Tudor's Being Erica, Murdoch Mysteries. And in 2012, he joined Shaw Media to oversee their development and production of multiple scripted titles for global TV showcase and history, as well as innovative original digital content. And we're done. <laughs> okay. Next is Jeremy. Jeremy joins us from Entertainment Tonight Canada. Jeremy's a digital content creator with extensive experience engaging online viewers on behalf of brands like Entertainment Tonight Canada, E1 Films, Cineplex Entertainment, Sharp Magazine, and Esquire. He's a host, he's a writer, he's a producer, he's worked throughout North America and overseas, and he is the man uh, in the know on the next innovative trends for digital content production. And we have imported all the way from Vancouver via Germany, Hamburg, uh, Mr. Jonas Wust. Jonas is the Senior Digital Strategy Manager with TELUS Optic Local and Story Hive. So since, before moving to Canada in 2010, uh, Jonas had a, a history background in uh, music. He actually was in charge of all negotiations and relationship with music owners when CBS acquired last Dot FM for $280 million in 2007. So he's at the cutting edge of this new technology. And since 2015, Jonas has been the Senior Digital Strategy Manager at Telus Optic Local and Story High, which provides millions of dollars, that's it, and millions of dollars in funding, as well as exposure for Canadian filmmakers. And with over 12 billion in annual revenue, Telus is one of the biggest telecommunication companies in Canada, and uh, Jonas has some interesting things to tell us about what's happening out west. So welcome, thank you. Um, our topic is TV versus online. How, oh, and I am Michelle Wasanek. I am the Film Sector Development Officer with the City of Toronto. I lead the Strategic Direction for Film, TV, Digital, and Animation for the City of Toronto. I said welcome already. All right, so. Um, Allison Carr, unfortunately, cannot be with us, but Robin is going to shoulder both chairs for that. All right, so the question that was posed in the uh, brief was, how has increased viewer engagement changed the way content is produced, and how important is it to the success of the project? Well, the answer is lots, and yes, and uh, we're going to tell you how and why. So working under the assumption that everyone in this room is used to being the smartest person in the room, we are going to uh, anticipate some questions, provide some context so, uh, as to what people are doing on different platforms and offer case studies of the kind of content that people are heading towards. And, and we'll answer the burning questions at the end. So, uh, Jeremy, we're going to start with you. Before we talk about these overarching questions of viewer engagement on TV and online, can you give us sort of a brief one-on-one -on, -one on what are the, what's the basic tool chest of online platforms we're going to be talking about, and how do they work? Um, online platforms that should be used today? Yeah. Well, I think that, um, you know, you obviously have like the major three, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, you know, micro video is becoming a huge thing of 
brand starting to realize that uh, it can connect with viewers on such more of an engaged level with uh, applications like Vine and Snapchat. And now we're looking towards um, you know, the exciting unknown with, with live video. You know, look at uh, how much of a buzz Periscope and, and Meerkat, well, not Meerkat anymore, but Periscope uh, made when it, when it launched and then Facebook Live and now brands are trying to figure out how to incorporate that new fun toy into their uh, strategy but from like a serious standpoint. So, um, you know, I think there's just a whole, you know, plate full of, of, of new toys, new tech platforms that are, are popping up every couple of months and um, it's definitely exciting from, you know, a digital production perspective to not really, you know, be the kid who says like, I just have to have and use all the toys possible, but it's it's more like, um, wouldn't it be cool to imagine how I can use that new um, toy or tech platform into my brand strategy? I think that's what we're looking for. So across these different platforms, what is it that you get the most uh, audience engagement from? Is you just like, Facebook I know is really strong for Vikings because you have such a dedicated fan base, but what are your kind of like, these are the basics, like we have to hit these and they're really successful for us. Well, it's a good question. I mean, uh, Facebook is without a doubt one of the best platforms for uh, video and video-based engagement, which of course uh, in, in drama is, is so valuable. You can clip something, you can share it, people can talk about it. Uh, it can be really satisfying when you're dealing with big plot points teases, uh, things leading up to an episode, things afterwards. It's just a, it's a fantastic um, viewer engagement platform. Twitter is great, uh, you know, but, but it, it, you know, our, our digital team uses Twitter for, for very specific messaging, uh, specific, you know, bites of information. Um, it's not always as easy for people to obviously interact with a tweet, uh, but it can also be really valuable, especially when they get to people hugely viral and retweeted, but, but that can sometimes be a bit more elusive. Mm -hmm. I think we are in the, um, uh, the audio visual industry, we're kind of blessed that um, the, the platforms that we mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that didn't start it as, as video serving platforms, they all kind of switched their title a little bit, and they're really all focusing on video, it's kind of good for us if we're working in the automotive industry right now and talk about this, it would, that wouldn't be like a great fit necessarily. So you know, all of these platforms are really heavily focused on video because a lot of the brand new advertising revenue is going in that direction. Um, so so, so it, and from our point of view, we, we'd like to, uh, those three, to answer your question, are really the focus for us because video is a big component of, of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. So and we're talking about online really is about increasing viewer engagement that and on these value added platforms. And that can be, entirely new content, or it can be in complementary content. And, and you guys all offer different versions of that. So um, let's say, Robin, you know, Vikings is about entrenching that fan base and that franchise. It's about, mm -hmm. it's designed to draw eyeballs. It's designed for audience members. And how is it important, how important is it for creative content production partner to be involved there? Can you, can you talk about um, these two formats not being mutually exclusive for you? Sure, yeah. I mean. For us in drama, we can never take our audience for granted, not for one season. You can never just assume that because everyone showed up last season, they will show up again. You have to constantly re-engage and, uh, and shore up your fan base and satisfy them and give them opportunities to engage with the content in new ways every season. You can't repeat yourself. So for season four of Vikings, like Vikings has been a wonderful uh, hit for us on history and, and, and across a lot of our uh, you know, partner platforms. Uh, but for the fourth season of Vikings, we knew we weren't going to have, say, the kind of paid media campaign that you would have when you're launching a brand new series. But we still knew we had to do something really special, really big, um, uh, to let the fans know that the show was coming back and to also tease a little bit of what was to come and, and just re-engage them after it being off the air for a year. So we came up with um, a, a really wonderful project called Vikings, a world reveal, that I'd love to actually play a clip yeah, from that so you can get a sense of what it was. Join us on an epic journey into the world of Vikings. 
Plus, with exclusive interviews and behind-the-scenes access, the world of Vikings is revealed like never before. We've used um, yak hair. We've had to shave a lot of yaks. I try to bring as much as myself into my life. I think a lot of women can relate to her. Step inside our world. This is the great hall. Celebrate a brand new season by visiting a world revealed at history.ca slash Vikings. Prepare yourself. Oh, well, oh, yeah, we're going to show uh, a few of the different pieces of the campaign, yeah. Corcoran, they are designed for Vikings. To be honest, we didn't have, we had, had really little or no reference to start off with. For every main actor, I would do a board. And yes, absolutely, it's taken from modern hairstyles, because you want the young audience. That's where the punk hairstyles come in, the undercuts, the shaving. The man one was a big hit. One hair that I'd really like to use in the earth, if we ever get to use it, is got some kind of an animal on their head. I mean, I really am sad that I don't have Travis in my chair every morning only to shave his head and I was shaved by five minutes. Oh. Here he is, Urbu! Come in here, you devil's skin. Come in here and talk about your hair. <laughs> this was my favorite hairstyle. <laughs> He's the best. <laughs> He's my favorite. references, anything that give us a fairly accurate picture and make our concept weapons. We then change the blade for bamboo. So they're running around with all day with really lightweight weapons, which means they can work all day and they can go half a leather. So we, we knew we wanted to create an interactive experience. We felt that that was going to be really important, especially because this was a digital initiative that had to offer something different from, from the linear experience. And we wanted something that was really interactive. And there was a, a, a terrific um, digital shop here in town called Jam3 that we worked with in creating uh, this, this campaign and this, this initiative, A World Revealed, which was both a website, but it also featured a lot of content that we could then push out on many platforms. So, so it's cost effective. You're actually you're actually, you know, building some momentum because you're you're it's cost effective. Yeah, it was platform agnostic. I mean we created a home, obviously, uh, an interactive website on, on, on history.ca, which enjoyed I think about half a million page views on its own. But actually that just pales in comparison to how many people we reached where we took the individual pieces of content and then sent them out across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, we had a linear uh, advertising campaign which was pushing to the website, and uh, uh, we, they were on YouTube, they got shared you know, tremendously, and, and I think that was a real lesson for us, that, that rather than, than only asking people to engage with this digital initiative on, on a specific web, website, when we have the opportunity to create a lot of, of spin-off content, that that should really be embraced, because we can reach just exponentially more people. That aggregate is, uh, is the real win here, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and, and what you're giving people is uh, more than a peek behind the curtain. You're giving them that personal connection. And we were talking about how important it is if you're going to delve into the digital stream and the online stream, it has to be authentic. 
it has to be, it has to reach, it has to be relative to the audience because it, they have to be able to get into it and share it. That's where the success comes. So maybe, Jonas, do you want to speak to, you know, maybe a little bit about what's happening out west with uh, TELUS, which, you know, we had this discussion with TELUS is, uh, is different out there than it is what we think, perhaps. I'm not sure all of you know this, but if, there might be a few people that don't know this, that over in the west, and we but TELUS is not just a cell phone company. And I'm sure you all tell us subscribers here, but we, uh, we, we're also a, a, a BDU, a, a cable provider, and can get you internet connection. So as an example, we don't have Rogers over in the West, but you can, for example, go tell us. Um, so what, what we do is that um, um, we have this, this mandate to support local filmmakers. And, um, and we create local stories with local filmmakers. And that's sort of the mandate is twofold. It's supporting the filmmakers and it's telling local stories that are not being told anywhere else. And, and, and we do that through a, a number of different programs. And, and it's really shifted for us the way we do it. Traditionally, we would have just made stuff and put it on, on our, onto our um, VOD service, the Telus VOD service. That was kind of back in the days. But since then, we realized that what we really try to do is make an impact for the filmmakers in the communities. And in order to do that, we want to reach an audience. And we realized, well, it's okay. There's an audience, of course, on our VOD service because we have lots of subscribers, one million subscribers now. It's fantastic. It's really good. But there are a lot of other people in Western Canada, actually all over Canada, actually all over the world. I might be interested in a, in a, in a, in a, um, a local story about surfing in Tofino. There's a really amazing surfing in Tofino. So we, we, we did like a, a big story with this. And, and we realized, well, we want to find the audience. And, and so it goes back to, to your point, Robin, like realizing that we need to go where the audience is. And, and social class is a huge, huge thing. And we don't even, we have a website, but I, I never even, I don't even go to our own website because I can ask people to come to my website, that's cool, but, but people are already on Facebook, they're already on Twitter, they're already on Instagram, why don't I just go where they are? It seems to be like a little more straightforward. Mm -hmm. And so we put a lot of emphasis on, on reaching people with our video content, reaching them where they are and sort of to the earlier question that is for us, largely Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Okay. Did that answer your question? I'm not even sure. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're talking about an immediacy that yeah. that that you're getting from this online world, um, and and a reward system actually is what we are. So for something like Vikings, you've got this longer term engagement that you have. You're sustaining it. You're rewarding. You're building on your fan base, and you're able to leverage that across multiple platforms. So it actually becomes cost effective. So for ET Canada, you're working on a 24 hour clock. Yeah. And you have to be current, you have to be now, and that information has to go, and, 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 and not a lot of people are gonna go back to that same, the way that they may go back and just you know, look dreamily at uh, you know, one of their favorite <laughs> actor's eyes on uh, Vikings, but for you, it's like that information is immediate, and it goes out, and that's your goal, right? So talk about how, how different that is to try to create that kind of, um, some of the strategies you've used to create that, in, that immediacy, that currency. Well, first of all, what uh, what you were saying about um, you know being mindful that some of your viewers may not be going back to your website. Sometimes they're they're a fan of your brand, but only on Facebook, only on YouTube. And I think that's that's something that brands don't really realize today. That uh, you know it's it's almost like an insult to admit that maybe uh, a, a social platform is more popular than their uh, main like online destination website. But I think it's just so important to treat um, all these initiatives, whether you know, putting your brand on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or, or even even Snapchat. It's to uh, realize that the viewer there is going to uh, resonate with the content that you're putting on that platform. So maybe your goal may be to try and redirect them back to you know the motherland. But to them, Snapchat, your Snapchat channel on the application is the motherland to them. And you just have to accept that and, and just create its own ecosystem there. Um, as far as you know, what uh, our, our day is like creating online content for each Canada as a digital property, um, it's really, it, it, I would say it's about um, you know, trying to overcome that challenge of putting out such an abundance of content on Twitter and Facebook and realizing that, uh, especially on Twitter, you know, a few minutes later, it's, it's, it's kind of lost, you know? It's almost I, instantly obsolete as the exactly. it gets out, right? I mean, Snapchat, it's literally gone after 24 hours, but like Twitter, it's there, but it's just, it, it, get, it gets lost and uh, you're, you suddenly have to start thinking about how to create uh, content that's a 
bit more engaging, how to be mindful of the way that you're packaging your content um, through social posts, um, you know, just like best practices with thumbnails and headlines and, and really understanding the social platform that you're using. Um, and I think just through trial and error, you just you really have to be consistent with it. Trial and error, yeah, and this is something that I was finding interesting. Everyone says, oh, digital world, wild, wild west, go risk, do it, jump in, talk to people, make things happen. There is no right, there is no wrong. There is wrong. Yes, there is wrong, um, but I think that some of my personal successes, uh, whether it be as myself as a you know, digital creator or with um, ET Canada, the digital brand, um, it's really been through uh, trial and error, not, not looking at a rule book. You know, some of these, these new uh, applications or platforms on social media don't really have, you know, a, a set guide of this is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is how to find success. You know, this is how to properly um, create a collaboration with a social influencer. You know, sometimes there is no rule book and you really have to take initiative to take a risk sometimes. Obviously, be mindful of like what the consequences could be, but um, you know, most of the time it's just we go through trial and error and realize, okay, that thing didn't really get as much engagement as we thought, but like, hey, we tried it and now we can say what does not work. So failure is good, but yeah. to save everybody a little bit of failure, I think what the idea that um, these online, the digital, the other world, that's all about communication, the same way traditional television is. But if you are posting something on Snapchat and you're not sharing, then you're failing. If you're on Facebook and you're not sharing, you're failing. You have to use your hashtags, you have to have compelling content that is going to go out or it's not going to work. It doesn't matter if you've talked to the best people in the industry and you have the best looking something, it might just be living in your pocket. So that's something that we need to talk about too, I think is uh, creating that content is uh, that we've got three different sort of models in the way of the financing. And that's always, I mean, that, that's coming up, I know, later. I saw that about the financing. But, but you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't sort of address a little bit about, about it's expensive. Production is expensive. Uh, you know, as you were talking, you come from the world of music. And now you're at a, and it's very different, but now you're at a, a, at a giving um, scenario where you're actually throwing money at funds and it is Alberta BC so don't go you know chase the stage to try to hunt down Jonas for his money but uh, tell us a little bit about the different rules. First I'm going to have to, I'm not throwing money at anyone. You're going to have to use money you're going to have to use money. Sorry I had to, <laughs> I had to speak to that. Uh, wait, what was the question? The differences to music? Do you want to make music? Well, we yeah, were talking about music and how uh, it's it's cheap to produce something, yeah, say ten thousand yeah. dollars, and so, then and then how costly it is to do production. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, we'll address so each of them. So I worked in, in in music my whole life until one year ago, and there was a few things in music that were just I never really thought of it like the, the cost of production. In, in music, that's just not really like a big problem. Like, yeah, if you can get a record. Back in the days, it was a little different when you needed money to go to the studio and get it mastered and everything. But now you can you can make a very, very, very like a, like a professional sounding record that can go to number one in the, in the, in the charts for I don't want to say wrong number because but you know if you have twenty, thirty thousand dollars, you can get that up there on film. Ten x, hundred x. Like in terms of people, right? The, 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 the financing is so vastly different. And then the same with, with the distribution as well. I think the reason why, one of the key reasons why music's been going through that sort of that, some people call it what the digital revolution, whatever you want to call it, earlier was just because it was just possible back in the days of Cinema MP3. It was just a thing. And I'm sure we all remember our moments when we first downloaded that MP3 on Napster. Remember when it took like 15 minutes and you were like, oh my god, 15 minutes, one song, right? I mean, that just was possible back then, but film that just wasn't possible. Um, uh, so maybe that was a bit of the difference. Yeah, and Story Hub now, like, yeah. tell us what they're doing is that they're investing in filmmakers. Yeah. That's the way, that's the intention of Story Hub, right? That's correct, yeah. So we're investing in filmmakers, um, but in a way that the, re the, the returns are not supposed to go to us, and they're not going to us, they go to the filmmakers. So what we're really trying to do is with StoryPad, which is a, so we're throwing money and we're giving money to filmmakers and we, as part of our StoryPad program, it's um, sort of community-based and we, we allow the community, the audience to vote 
on who should receive funding from us. And it really allows us to uh, not only get everyone's input, because it's useful what do people actually like, but actually, you know, there's that whole thing about building a community before they even make the film. There's already a community of thousands and tens of thousands, thousands of people that voted for this, they invested already. It's kind of like Kickstarter, where, you know, when you yeah. fund something to Kickstarter, you already have that community of people that, in that case, gave you money. We don't take money from the audience, but there's this community building. That's my point. Um, and, and the idea is that we, as part of Story Hive, we are, we are investing in these filmmakers and they make great, great content, but what we really want them to do is take that content somewhere else or to make sure their career moves, off, moves forward based on this. So the investment is really investing into filmmakers for them to have a sustainable career in film. In Canada, in fact, no, they can go anywhere. That's totally fine for us. So the investment is not going to come back to us, and that's totally fine. Hopefully, they'll they'll they'll, they'll, they'll not forget us. But I always make the joke with the filmmakers that deal with that. I want for one day for them to not return my phone calls anymore. Yeah. I want for them to say like, oh, here's Jonas again. You know, you, well, I'm, I'm too busy now. I'm now playing with the big guys. That that would be like the result. Right. Would I be hurt? Yeah, maybe a little bit. But you know, the result yeah, technically would be kind of <laughs> they're now in Hollywood. They're now doing that thing. And, and, and we're getting there. Anecdotally, we hear that a lot. That because of the film, we give them ten thousand dollars to make a short film. It's not a lot of money, but it, it helps them make with their first production ever. They can then take somewhere else. And we hear a lot that because of that, they get jobs here or they travel here and they, they go to festivals. And, and IP is so important to our industry. Being able to own our own intellectual property and be able to you know create that environment that that sustains a creative. Uh, uh, sector, creative community, um, and then we're going to look at Jeremy now. Jeremy, you come up with uh, with your um, what was it we call it with your um, Vine? Yes. Your your Vine campaign for uh, during award season. So so this is a great a great look at how to do something immediate that's fun because of course social media a lot of that it it should be fun and that's how you engage people sure. a lot of it. It's not humor. It's it may be a, a personal connection, but. But uh, maybe Jeremy has something he's going to show about uh, how they managed to create something that was not high expense, but had a really big impact for their uh, for their brand. For their brand. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's a, a great transition to what you were saying about um, the cost effective. Just because when we think about you know the micro video industry and um, you know brands that are kind of like on the fence, even even if it's like a newsroom brand on the fence of uh, diving into these you know short form videos and. Uh, the production it takes, the ideas it takes, and we realize, well, for us, some of these videos on Vine, which we made a really strong push with over the past year and a half, you know, could take maybe you know 20 minutes of editing um, and blow up to a hundred, a couple hundred thousand views uh, for a cost of less than nothing. So we uh, decided to, like I said before, take a risk, a um, bit of trial and error, and look into Vine as a platform. Um, we first really tried to use it seriously. Uh, last film festival during TIFF uh, to highlight like the the most chaotic moments of the red carpet because I think at that point um, we realized that um, like a lot of entertainment uh, brands who cover TIFF it's a lot of ideas are almost exhausted you're trying to figure out okay how can what's the next thing we, we can we can reach how can we top it from last year and then Vine started blowing up and realized well what if we use this six second byte platform that's on a loop, which is so key, and say, we just want to show the most chaotic moments of fans screaming for George Clooney. And we were lucky that the feed that we had was this beautiful, sexy um, 5D footage. And so we just had this, this whole compilation of um, little video bursts um, throughout the festival of, uh, we called it Tiff Hysteria. And so it was little bite-sized moments like that, which was great. And after that, we started thinking, okay, well, there are now these Vine stars that are emerging from this platform. Um, why don't we start collaborating with them? We started dabbling in, the, in that uh, category. And then by the, uh, this past 2016 award season, we thought, well, why don't we take it one step further? Let's really create um, you know, a three-way collaboration between a Vine influencer, a mainstream Hollywood celebrity, and then us, um, as the producer creating like a comprehensive uh, narrative series through like multiple episodes that will almost complement ET Canada's award season broadcast coverage. So we luckily enlisted the help of Mr. Allen Fick, Canada's favorite TV dad. Um, he is just such a smart and uh, you know easy to work with individual and he helped um, you know lead this, this boot camp narrative that we created 
So this is a boot camp on how to survive a board season. Yeah. So and, and you have some clips for us? We do if the Wi-Fi is working, fingers crossed. All digits crossed. Let's and see. It is not so So you have to act it out. You can roll it out. That's, that's <laughs> I cannot do Alan Thick justice, but um, Basically, we, we got Alan Thicke, and then we got um, a Vine influencer whose name is Brittle Star, and he goes by the name of Stuart Reynolds. He has two sons who are also Vine stars, so it's almost like this social star family. And we had Alan Thicke teaching the social star family online in many episodes how to survive the award season. So it'd be an episode in six seconds of how to uh, smile on the red carpet, how to take care of your award show trophy, um, and you know, it, was from the Golden Globes until the Oscars, and we found that uh, fans really resonated with it because if you know someone wins during an award show and suddenly we uh, release the video and then tweet it out, and it's uh, you know tip on how to polish your award show trophy, but in, in a comical way. So and how many hits did you get? We these? we got approximately two million views for that series. Um, it got play on Sirius XM radio. Um, it was definitely a first initiative for us, and I think for Vine itself, I I think we were the first Canadian TV brand to take on that that uh, narrative initiative. So this um, is obviously something that ET is going to continue. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. So this kind of creative engagement, the kind yeah. of idea that you know we're going to have fun with this, six seconds of fun, and stick around. There's going to be another six seconds of fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what uh, you guys will have to look that up on yeah. online, on ET yeah. online. Um, now, you're in an interesting position here. With, with, um, with Vikings, it's a co-pro. Mm -hmm. And what does that allow you in the way of access and funding for, for, so for the uh, ancillary complementary? Yeah, because we're a production partner on Vikings, um, we're able to work really closely with the, uh, all the creative teams on the show and all the talent uh, involved in the show to make some special exclusive content that no one else has access to. And that's invaluable because having something exclusive uh, that is truly <laughs> available in one place or, or, or from one outlet is really helps you stand out. Mm -hmm. um, and with this project, I mean, we really put a lot of thought into the voice of the project and making sure it was authentic and in keeping with the actual look and feel of the show that was in touch with what fans were interested in knowing a lot more about, that it featured the actors that they love, and we could only have done that as a production partner. It would have been, we spent a week over in Ireland doing this, and it would have been impossible to do if it was uh, a different kind of relationship, a more removed relationship. And it was great, they opened their door, they let us on all the sets, uh, and, and the cast was extremely generous. Um, I wanted to pick up on, on, on a point that, that um, came up earlier though, um, which is the importance of trial and error mm -hmm. when you are creating this additional content, when you are looking um, to enhance viewer engagement. If you're creating one piece of content and only releasing it on one platform, that puts a lot of pressure on that single initiative. And uh, you know, when, when I think about this project, what was great is we created 12 to 15 pieces of content and then put them all out across to probably, I mean, the, guess eight to 12 platforms. And it was fascinating because some did not take and some did and you learn from that and you can respond to that as you as you go. You know, for example, Catherine Winnick's uh, videos constantly had tremendous response and social reach and were shared. I mean, you, you know, uh, Catherine of course is, is one of our Canadian stars on the show and her audience is so social and <laughs> Uh, enthusiastic and, uh, and tech savvy um, that she was just fantastically um, embraced and her videos were shared. And it's, it's interesting to see that engagement and we were able to then enhance that and augment that and help satisfy those fans further. And sometimes, so, so sometimes what you're doing is you're sending out the message to the world, some of it gets picked up, but also you get haters when you get online. You get haters when on TV as well and then uh, when we were working for the broadcasters, remember how, and here at the city of Toronto, when somebody complains, you know, that carries a lot of weight um, versus the 5,000 people, you know, who come out to, to watch Suicide Squad, at, you know, at 10, at 10 at night when we close down the streets, 5,000 people are shouting and, and we had no complaints, but, but one complaint carries a lot of weight. We love the haters though, because the haters help to decide 
how to steer your content, right? I mean, is that is that fair sometimes? Well, it, it's like, you know, what if you had nobody reacting, you know, so you didn't have positive or, or able contents, but there was just no reaction. I think that, you know, if you do have negative comments, one way to look at it is these are passionate fans. They are taking the opportunity to really, you know, go on Twitter and, and voice their opinion. Maybe their opinion doesn't really make sense or they're being a bit too aggressive, but... And on that note... Very aggressive <laughs> in life. This is not a drill. that uh, it's important that you need to have both positive and, and negative opinions. I mean, you look at, uh, I, I remember someone was uh, analyzing a, a YouTube, like a viral YouTube video, and they were saying how, you know, oh, it has like, you know, 400,000 views, but there was no interaction, there's no likes, there's no dislikes, there's no comments, and someone pointed out, well, that doesn't really seem like a successful video. You know, there was no interaction from, from the viewer, whereas a video that you know may have you know a couple hundred dislikes and you know a couple hundred more likes, at least you know like okay we're starting a conversation here. And I think that that's the goal of any um, you know news broadcasters. They want to start a conversation. I mean, you're inviting people to come watch your watch what it is you've created. You need that feedback to know how to respond and create something that is going to target them, that is going to be rewarding, and draw those eyeballs back. And that is the same for traditional broadcast as it is for uh, our online world. We deal with a lot of, I don't know if anyone actually focus on what we're saying, but uh, we deal with, do a lot of um, sort of factual content. And it's especially when we deal with certain subject matters that we create that online discussions. We always know like, now we're onto something. Clearly we, we, we're creating some sort of change because on Facebook we see a lot of people from both sides of the debate debating. Often we have a firm opinion when it comes to, for example, we did this big piece about LGBTQ rights, and obviously there's no, no debate around that. Shouldn't be a debate, but there was still a debate online, which is somewhat disheartening. But at the same time, it meant for me, okay, we're still touching on something that still needs to be debated. Okay, I'm, I'm happy that we're part of it and part of you know pointing people in the in the right direction when it comes to that debate. Yeah. Oh, that? <laughs> right. uh, the other thing that often comes up uh, is you know everybody is being told you have to have digital content to your traditional um, programming, but the thing that always comes up, okay. How am I supposed to do this on top of all my other work? Oh. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just talking between the <laughs> gaps. Um, I mean, that, that's a common thing. <laughs> the answer is it's impossible. You, you, you can't be. <laughs> There's somebody else there who's like purposely trying yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to wait the front of the lock is Amazing as it can be, but but you can't uh, you know you you also have to 
to offer this, this uh, these digital extensions. It's really critical. And you have to offer it on, on the terms of the audience, is really what we're hearing. If they're, they're not going to be watching it, most of them at 10 o'clock on a Thursday, they're going to watch when they feel like it. Right? And that's the advantage of PBRs, it's the advantage of the digital streaming. Now, um, most of you know, uh, we're going to talk just briefly about things like the Netflixes, the Hulus, the New World Order. Right? So um, TV, especially in Canada, is highly regulated. right? And online, it's free, or, or it's, it's a nominal subscription fee. It, it's, it's pioneer country. So um, there, there is a system, and the system is you have to create content that's globally competitive, and you have to try to diversify it as much as possible. Something that um, people probably heard that Star Trek is coming to Toronto. Did you guys hear this? Star Trek, the TV show shouldn't hear. The TV, the TV show shouldn't hear. So it's, it's Star Trek, the next voyage is going to be shooting um, here, in, uh, here in Toronto, and that's a, that's a CBS show. Now they're doing something really interesting about how they're going to be um, drawing out this content. They know they have a global fan base. They also know that they own the whole backlog of all the CBS, uh, of, of all the Star Trek. So they already know that moving forward, they have a franchise that's going to work. So they are releasing the pilot on CBS on their broadcast, and then from then on, the rest of the the rest of the series is going to be released on their CBS. to the rest of the series. Yes. Yeah. But then when we talk about these kind of examples, it's, it's very easy to, to talk about Star Trek. That they already have that big following where they can get away with things that 99.9% .9 of the other producers, in fact, even more in the world, they, they can't do as you launch something new. That's a completely different stretch. It's still audience focused, but to kind of, you know, to lock it away, you have to sign up to something that, that would be quite difficult, right? Um, so, so I think we'd like to do that, always come up with these sort of these examples that the stuff things do it, and, and that might not necessarily work that way. Yeah, it could be a canary in the mines too, you know, it's the first one to go out and see how it goes, right? So that's an interesting mm -hmm. thing. I think, oh yes, we're going to get into Q&A's, good timing, please. Yeah, my question has I think you're going to have to wait for that, yeah. yeah. Is my turn Stefano? Do you Very go? Well. Here he comes. <clears throat> My question has to do with the term engagement 
And I think from a public service perspective, like the, the title of the, uh, the panel, Television versus an Online, implies that television old school wasn't engaged or didn't allow for engagement, and online has all these new engagement tools, which I wouldn't quibble with. But when I think of public service broadcasting in the past, like CBC or community broadcasting, always had ways to engage viewers, like with fawn-in shows, or even today if we think of, you know, Cross Canada Checkup is still a hugely popular format where Canadians can call in and hear one another on the telephone to debate content. But that kind of engagement meant that the viewers become part of the content of the show. So Cross Country Checkup is about what Canadians think, or community media is about bringing in studio panels and people get to produce, be part of the production process. So it's a really, there always has been the possibility for a deep level engage, engagement in content. So my question might be, yes, there's a lot more tools we can use to do that. People can upload their own videos easily, they can text, they can you know, engage in online chats. Is the engagement that you guys are talking about, about putting viewers at the center of the content, or is it really just getting viewers on multiple platforms and engaging with them after the fact, I guess. So what, what's the quality of the engagement, I guess, is my question. And are the new tools improving the depth and quality? Or is it like in the old days, it just comes back to your intent as a producer if you really want your audience in the middle of the show? Or you know, what are you trying to do with your production? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good question. And, and in a lot of ways, the genre that you're working in is going to dictate to what extent um, your, the, the, the viewers can be part of the content specifically with, with news or, or documentary or reality. Uh, that's obviously a lot easier than scripted and, and you know, uh, challenging to, to drop the audience specifically into perhaps the show itself, but at the same time, there are a lot of other ways to engage. So I think you have to really tailor that engagement to the specific genre that you're working in. I think it's also about, um Know, knowing where, first of all, what your target demographic is today compared to, you know, way back when. And something that I think we've all mentioned is using, incorporating the platforms that you know your audience is there. Um, you know, so if you know that you have a, you know, a decent following on Twitter, you know, for me personally, I feel much more engaged to tweet in my opinion to a talk show rather than pick up the phone and call a number and get in a conversation. Um, you know, it also could just be the way that uh, technology has affected us over the past five years where maybe we're not all um, clamoring to get into, you know, a one-on-one -on -one voice conversation. Sometimes we feel our, our new form obviously of conversation is uh, through social media interaction. I think that, um, you know, it's worth trying to capitalize on that. From our point of view, it's quite a little bit too late because uh, any resident of Eastern Alberta is eligible for two type of funding. So in our case, the audience can technically become a filmmaker, no problem, and we do this all the time. We work with people that you know, have very little experience in filmmaking. So kind of because of our model, everyone can kind of engage in it. But I think what you was hearing, what you were suggesting is that things haven't changed that much. That there was always engagement, call-in shows, there was, you can always send a letter to the editor, you can always, get, you can, you can always be a hater, or you can always do all these things. If, if that's what you were suggesting, and I kind of agree with you, to be honest. I think the game is still the same, but the tools are sharper. Yes. Does that make sense? No, I tools are definitely the same. Anyway, but you know what I mean. It's just it's like that multiplier. sharing. Yeah. It's just more than sharing, for example. That's always the way we have blockbusters, right? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, you got to watch this film. Now I'll do this online. Now I'll do this really quickly online. And now this really can snowball. So it's all just a little faster. But the mechanisms of recommending content giving feedback and telling your friends about it and, 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 and you know, maybe not liking the show, making that voice, you know, making your opinion heard. It's always been around. It's not like that we invented something was really new. Does the technology and the scale that has really advanced that kind of uh, communication engagement? The scale and the speed. You get instant feedback across many platforms at once. And it can be a lot to take in. And it's important to take it all in, to pay attention to to all of them to be responsive. Questions? Stefano. Oh, oh, you, you I have a question. <laughs> Hello. Question for Robin. Um, as you see some of the content that you create, uh, as you kind of cut that up and distribute it online, like the, the Vikings piece mm -hmm. that you showed, um, are there instances where you're starting to see some of that content that you share online compete from an engagement standpoint in terms of views with uh, some of your broadcast ratings, and if so, in terms of like number of people that are seeing a piece of content versus a, an episode, 
And if so, what, what type of ramifications or what type of disruption is that causing in terms of like from a revenue or from a production model? Um, I guess the short answer is no, we don't see this additional content that we're launching on these various platforms as competing with, with some of the core shows. We see them really as being complementary uh, and giving people a chance to uh, just to engage on a broader level at their own time, at their own speed. They can watch two, they can watch one, or they can watch all 12. They can watch them over the course of a week. And it's not necessarily interfering. We're just glad that they are engaging with both the shows and this additional content. But they're really sorting out when they want to watch those given pieces. We have another question. This gentleman in the front. Just a comment on the, um, the Star Trek. It strikes me that um, in a world where you don't necessarily own your product, particularly in Canada, where you license it, I'd be rather concerned about the CBS model getting traction to where they say, hey, you know what, we can make as much money off of directly feeding our audience. Simultaneous substitution, that's nice. We get some money from that, and it's been a big pocket of money for the US studios up until potentially now. Uh, that would be a concern uh, to, a com to a country like ours where so many of our broadcasters don't own their product. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's it's a new model. Let's see how it goes and see how it impacts. I mean, we're we're in a uh, uh, a time of reckoning right now. You know, with the technology changing, with the rules changing, with uh, the engagement happening, it's a time that really has to focus on our own creative IP. I think that's that's really important for all of our domestic industry in Canada, um, and to sustain us as as creative cities, as a global. Um, Creative Industries Marketplace. I mean, what we're seeing is a lot of new opportunities and, and financing models are emerging for content. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there will be some that um, exclude certain arrangements. But there are also, I find so many more new opportunities that I think more doors are opening uh, than closing. For example, we have this new show which you mentioned earlier, um, Travelers, which is a partnership that we're doing with Netflix. This is a show created uh, by Canadians, produced by Canadians, it's shooting up in Vancouver right now, it's starring Eric McCormack, uh, and it's looking great. Um, <laughs> and this is a, you know, a, a really interesting partnership for us, because Netflix is, is taking many, tori many territories outside of Canada, but in Canada, this is going to be a wonderful flagship new drama for Showcase, and, um, and this was a, a way that the producers were able to get the show made. Uh, so, so that's just one example of, of how sometimes there are doors that are actually opening. Um, and you know, we're, we're evaluating each, each model as, as, a, as a potential opportunity. And you said some important things. It looks great. Yes. The content is interesting. It's now. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the, just like, give us a tagline on. Uh, well, there, there are some people among us, and uh, they are people. They, they, well, they, they're, they're here from another time and place, and, uh, and they are, I can't really tell too much more. <laughs> You'll have to like look online. I think we, we, we've released a little bit of information, but. Um, look online, that's the answer to But everything. speaking of, we're already thinking about very big questions as to how are we going to get people on the wavelength of the show. It's probably not going to debut for at least you know six to nine months, but we already, as a team, our digital team, our marketing team, we're working very closely with the producers to think about how do we get people already on the wavelength of this brand new show, which, as you're saying, is so much, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to to launch. You, have, you know, it doesn't have a pre-existing ground zero uh, 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 fan base like something like yeah. Star Trek, um, and we are excited about that. We're you know people as much as as there are some really dominant brands that that will already grab people, uh, there's always an appetite for that new, really exciting, interesting idea. You know, it has to be distinctive, and this is. And um, and we're already thinking about how to use digital extensions, social, uh, to to get people on the wavelength and excited about this brand new project. And, you know, so it's a holistic approach. Absolutely. Actually. It's already, you know, well, well underway nine months in advance of launch. 
Hi there. Um, while social media does have the ability to um, increase social and community engagement, you did touch upon it, but how do you streamline your messaging and as well achieve relevancy amongst the midst of so many um, contributors and content creators? You mean like as part of your own, a part of your own team? As part of your own team or your individualized brand? Well, if, if, you're, if we're talking about your own team, and obviously uh, making sure that everyone's on the same page for like a really thorough digital strategy is so key. Uh, a lot of brands, uh, I find they would treat social uh, management or community management just as, you know, we'll have just like a bunch of people um, kind of a have access to the social accounts, but maybe they don't really have social media experience, maybe they don't kind of understand really the best practices. And as a result, you can see just a lot of inconsistencies with uh, the brand tone and messaging on you know, something compared to like a Facebook post compared to Twitter or the way that you're uh, you know, posting something to YouTube. So obviously, yeah, making sure that uh, everybody's on the same page and understands that you know, basic 101 um, you know, guide, guideline, rule book, you know, the same way if you, if you were um, managing the editorial components of a website, Make sure all your writers know this is, you know, we adhere to CP style. It's just make sure what kind of your uh, managers know kind of, kind of style you're uh, adhering to for social media. I think that um, to kind of answer your question, how to uh, stay relevant, stay relevant, or, or, or stick out among like the. We talked about this earlier. We talked about you can't be generic. Yeah. You have to have a really distinctive voice that you have to bring to it. Yeah. And, uh, and and something else maybe we didn't touch on that might be, uh, what about influencers? Does it pay to have an influencer these days on some of these projects? Yeah, I think that uh, the influencer collaboration has definitely been a really fun experience for us at IndieCanada.com because we've been able, again, through trial and error, uh, but not so much error, just through figuring out what kind of works and then what does what works really well and uh, realizing that the rule book for how to work with influencers isn't really doesn't really exist um, on every single platform so um, a bit about what you were talking about of um, you know your new TV show kind of just trying to take initiative see what platform it works um, it's sort of like why not take initiative and be the brand that other brands end up talking about months or years from now to say like I'm practicing um, my techniques because of, let's say, what uh, that show Travelers did with their digital strategy because they tried it out and it seems like they knew what they were doing. So I think that for social collaborations, it does pay off because you are, first of all, um, you know, tapping into their audience and you're introducing your audience to um, you know, a star on on the platform. You know, if we're talking about Vine and we have our own Vine following, and then we suddenly partner with um, someone like Brittle Star, uh, it immediately gives us a bit more cred. Um, it's definitely great to to establish these partnerships within the ecosystem, and um, it's it allows us to, I guess, explore new avenues of, of content creation. One thing that you mentioned already, credibility and authenticity when you work together with it, like an influencer or a YouTube creator, you know, all those personalities. I think it's a bit of a hype thing in our industry. We're like, oh, we should get an influencer on board because that's what we do right now. But it's something that's actually not that easy. You have to really find a good fit, authenticity from both sides. Absolutely. So if you work with any influencer that has a bit, a bit of a following, that's the first thing I'm going to say. Like, I'm not just going to put your product or your thing, even if the product is an entertainment product in, in, in mind, and they're not going to do that, rightly so. But also has to work the other way around, where, you know, if you you might have to pay for this, it can be very expensive working with these uh, these creators. Uh, you have to make sure that it actually brings authenticity also to your brand or your product or your entertainment. So uh, just as an example, we were looking, you know, doing the same thing on the West Coast, looking at some sort of local creators and influencers, and um, there's very talented people out there. And uh, But we realized that a lot of, just, I'm just giving you an example why it didn't work for us, was that a lot of the people that we were sort of looking at, they weren't filming this for us. They were, they, they were like, say it was a, um, cooking thing, like a, you know, like a cooking YouTube star that has like, you know, a bunch of followers. Really that person wanted to be chef, and the YouTube thing was just one outlet for them, which is fantastic, but we want to work with filmmakers, so there wasn't really, it was clear that that person didn't have the intent 
to go further in their career as a filmmaker, they wanted a YouTube channel and they wanted to be a chef. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it just, I'm giving you an example, it just didn't work for us because we wanted to support filmmakers. There are other people out there and we are going to be working with some people. Just try to illustrate that it's actually quite hard to find someone that fits into your strategy, find someone like a YouTube influencer or YouTube creator that, that fits into your strategy is actually a lot of work these days. For sure. And, and, and the, the caution may be also that don't just put content out there just because you feel you have to fill that void because that's an easy way to lose folks. I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna drive to your site, to your platform. If you have something interesting to say, unique, you have a view that is relatable, and that is, um, and you know, steal from the best. That's what this whole industry is about, steal from the best. Find out what people are doing that, that is successful. And how can you put a spin on that, your spin on it? Yeah. yeah, we talked about how important it is to have a lot of content on, on a multiplicity of platforms, but you don't want to go so far as to start throwing spaghetti at the wall and just seeing what sticks, because that can be really dangerous. You have to really know your, your voice and be true to that voice and have that be consistent across all the content. We were really cautious about that with this with this campaign, and um, I mean I think back even to the, when we, we first launched season one of Vikings, and a lot of people were starting to think about the show, but they hadn't seen anything yet. They didn't really know what it was, and and some of what they came up with. I mean, this is very early days. Were more kind of jokey memes, you know, more like the horn helmets and Hagar the horrible kind of you know Saturday morning cartoon kind of concepts, which we, we quickly let go of, and people let go of the moment they saw the show. Right. Because this was a show that really took these people seriously, took them as, as human beings, and uh, people we could deeply feel something for and relate to, uh, and this and, and that kind of tonality just did not work. Um, so I think you have to be very cautious about about voice, and when you do get that voice right, it can be so powerful. Um, I think we mentioned this some time ago, but uh, at a, a previous broadcaster that I, I worked at, we we were launching a new show and. We had two campaigns, and one was very expensive, and it was really conceptual, and a lot of people came up, put a lot of wonderful time and talent into, into creating this really cool website. And then, on the other hand, at an extremely low cost, the showrunner of the show, this was in the very early days of, of social media, created a, a Facebook page in, um, for the, the lead, uh, the lead um, uh, character in the show, not the actress, but the character, and started writing and updating it in her, uh, in the actual character's voice. And it was totally authentic, because it was the showrunner who was just having a great time, uh, and we encouraged it. She was the one typing it, so it was totally authentic to the show. And of course, of the two initiatives, which one exploded? But the Facebook page that, that cost almost nothing, and this other very, this beautiful conceptual site was not really what people wanted to engage with. So that was a real lesson in how critical it is to be true to the voice of the show and what people love about a given, uh, a given series. Yeah, there's a universe of choices out there. So what's going to make yours feel like you care <coughs> about what your audience is going to uh, is going to be, you know, watching, mm -hmm. being a part of? I, I'm trying to be mindful of the time. How are we doing here? Five minutes. <laughs> <gasps> Five minutes. Any other questions? Oh, good. Um, imagine, I guess, I was trying to imagine someone who watches a TV show and isn't that interested in what's happening online. Is there still an effort to drive from TV to online, or is there an effort? And maybe is there any risk associated with that to the, broad, to the broadcast, I guess is how I maybe put it that way. Um, or do you do it? Is there any drive at all? Do you care? Or is that person just left to the TV show? Well, I know for each together, we definitely uh, make like a conscious um, action to, to put digital elements into the news broadcast to drive to either what's trending online or what's trending on etcanada.com. So I think it's, it's obviously pretty important to make sure, I think um, viewers are much more engaged these days when the broadcast has uh, digital elements. You know, I think it's like you said, they want that 360 experience. They want to, you know, I want to be able to watch the Oscars um, on a, a, you know, a linear, um, a linear experience, but then also have my mobile device and have my uh, laptop open and um, see how the Oscar brand is uh, interacting with me on social media. Uh, maybe there's a value-added video on uh, 
the Oscars website. So I think, yeah, there's for us, we, we definitely um, try to incorporate our digital brand and the TV brand every night at 7.30, and uh, I think that it's, it's a success. Robin, you've got background with like two years and a bunch of other shows from the CBC as well as, as the Vikings. How, how does that relate to that question for you? Well, uh, you know, I think the, the world has changed so much and it continues to, and you kind of have to, you know, it, obviously embrace that. And right now, when we're launching shows, I mean, we um, we used our linear platforms. The, that initial uh, piece of video was actually a, a, an ad that ran on our linear channels, pushing to this initiative, pushing to the digital website, which in turn had a lot of great content that was pushing back to linear. So it, it's a bit of a virtuous circle. And in, in a kind of world of so many choices, we're just happy to have people engaged and we want to reward that and satisfy our fans and um, and you know shore them up, get them excited about the return of the show. So it's important you know that your objectives, you don't want to necessarily just push without you know, ultimately knowing where you're going to, and for us, we really were trying to push people towards the premiere of the show, letting them know it's back, letting them know how it's changed, letting them teasing what's coming up, letting them to give them a chance to engage with their um, with the favorite elements of the show. Um, but uh, for us, we we didn't mind pushing to various platforms as long as they continue to to push people back to the show itself and their love of the show itself. For us, it's a little bit different. And Robin, you mentioned your objective. So my objective is for people to watch our content. So when they find our content on our video demand service online and they, they watch it, they've done the thing I want them to do. Like for them to drive them also to the other thing, that would be just, you know, it, 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 it doesn't make a difference. We, we, one might argue we should invite them to tweet about the fact that they watched it because maybe that means more people. But it becomes inauthentic, you know, it's a, they've done the thing that we want them to do and, and there's just no need for us to you know, push, them, push them somewhere else. There are some exceptions where we had some content um, sort of complementary content that was available um, on VOD. You could watch the thing, and then there was like a three D. Like there was a VR experience that was complementary. That was the one example where we pushed to, to online because we just couldn't offer that on that space. But um, again, it's, it depends on the objective. My objective is to watch it. What you think? Thank you very much for doing that. That's kind of it. I think I'll, I'll add that um, you know, for ET Canada, I don't think we're we're ever trying to get viewers to watch the broadcast. Um, go to etcanada.com and then return back to the broadcast. I think that we think as our uh, of our TV brand and digital brand is two um, like standalone elements. Obviously, digital complements TV, but I think that digital for us really stands on its own. When you think of etcanada.com, it's Facebook uh, community, Twitter, uh, Instagram. So, uh, you know, when we're thinking about how to add the digital components to the broadcast, it's Here's the the you know the top story of the night, it's the news story. Uh, but then here's uh, the more enhanced version of that story on EasyCanada.com with an added photo gallery and you know an extended interview with this celebrity or that individual. Um, so I think that's how we do it. Maybe we'll just wrap up here and just go quickly and say, what, what are you excited about in the future? What's the, what's the next format that you're excited about? What's the next project that you're that you're keen on? Uh, Travelers. <laughs> season, well, in the second half of, 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 uh, of season four of Vikings, which is going to return later on this year. It would be interesting to see how you're going to roll out this brand new product. Uh, I think that's going to be fascinating to see how you're going to Well, speaking of, I mean, we already know there's going to be a season five, uh, which, is, which starts shooting next month. And we're already planning a special digital initiative, which I can't really get into yet, but, but you know, that this is probably a year out from launch, and we're already planning what that's going to be. Gives you some timelines. Uh, I would say, I would go back to live video. I think that Facebook Live is going to present some pretty incredible opportunities for not just TV brands, I think all brands, once they uh, start trying to figure out how it works for them or if it works for them, the opportunity for a TV brand to live broadcast an interview or even like a fully produced, you know, uh, Facebook show to an audience that could potentially far exceed your broadcast audience and then realize you're pretty much not really paying anything for that. That's incredible. That's amazing. It's a disruptor right there. Um, I am excited about figuring out, again, stories. What I mean
mean by that is that we, so we have these new platforms, or newish platforms, Facebook and Facebook Live, VR, and the, we have to come up with the right type of storytelling for all of these platforms, because they're not necessarily the same, the ones being blocked in the traditional TV. Sometimes we can just apply those also to another, like Facebook Live, you might argue, like the thing that worked live on, on TV could also work live on, on Facebook Live, potentially. Uh, but in VR, you have to come up with completely different stories and how they work, and, that, and, and I think in all the new platforms that we're gonna hopefully together develop over the next few years, we're gonna keep reinventing what a story is, because none of this stuff is gonna work without the story. Uh, it's just gonna be boring, people are just not gonna watch it or consume it. And that's actually really, really exciting to come up with new types of storytelling, like that, we're doing that right now, and that's, that, that's pretty cool, so I'm excited to do that over the next few years. All right, thanks everybody for sticking around through the beeps and blocks and, uh, and our comments. And hopefully you got something out of it. We really appreciate that you came and uh, discoverability, keep it coming. Thank you. Thank you.